guys. So if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Hey guys, today we will be going over the evil aligned gods of the Forgotten Realms. Starting with lawful evil, neutral evil and ending with chaotic evil. Hope you guys enjoy and let's get into it. Asmodeus is the evil god and an archdevil in Dungeons and Dragons. He is the absolute ruler of the Nine Hells, stationed squarely in its infernal core of Nessus. His daughter Glacia is one of the commanders in charge of the lower level. Bluff. Asmodeus was introduced in AD and D First Edition. In the Monster Manual, no less. His domain was detailed in Dragon Magazine. It's mostly stayed the same since. Asmodeus was part of the Creation War. After defeating the Primordials, the evil god set out to kill each other over who would take over the universe, while the good and neutral ones tried to stop them. Asmodeus was able to get a large number of angels to side with him and led a rebellion against the heavens. He was struck down and landed on Badr, which originally had seven hells, but he made two more just for shits and giggles. There he set up his kingdom of hate. Asmodeus takes on the form of a boring, run-of-the-mill Halloween devil. Oh, except for being 13 feet tall. He has impossibly high charisma and can only really be damaged with holy items. Typically, he's a patient schemer who can wait epics for his plans to resolve, but during the rare times he doesn't use stars forming and dying to time himself, he uses guile rather than force usually. His ruby rod has a lot of at-will spells that he can use, and he can alter lesser beings. Yes. It's called the ruby rod. The ruby rod of Asmodeus. It's been around since forever, and, yes, it looks exactly how you think it looks. Some of his followers even carry similar ruby rods, but they are far inferior in length, girth, and potency to his. This has been an obvious dick joke. We now return you to your original article already in progress. Second edition. The book Guide to Hell gave us a completely new view of Asmodeus. At the dawn of creation, beings of law began to rise up from the primordial soup. The mightiest of these were Ahriman and Jazirian. Jazirian was a feathered and winged serpent, while Ahriman was scaled and forked of tongue. They bit down onto each other's tails, and together began to create law in the chaos. The first thing that they created was the unity of rings. Everything keeps happening over and over again. This place, the first ring, became known as the Outlands. When it was defined the other planes fell in around it, thus creating the outer planes. Next up after this was to honor their three aspects, law, good, and evil. From this came the rule of three, stressing the importance of the number three in all things. Finally there needed to be a third rule, the center of the universe. This is where it started to go wrong, while the Outlands would have been the obvious choice, Jazirian pushed for heaven, while Lariman pushed for hell. The two began to pull and struggle at and with one another, until they eventually tore each other apart. Jazirian flew up to the heavens, each drop of blood she spilled from her severed tail tip turned into a fully formed cow. The wingless Ariman, though began to fall, he in fact, fell so hard, that upon hitting the seventh layer of hell, he fell through and in his crash, created two new layers. Where his blood hit the ground, pit fiends sprung up. Ariman got stuck in his pit, unable to leave. I and their struggle the two serpents had lost much of their power, and began to nurse themselves back to health. In this time, the other gods overtook them, banded together and began to colonize the plains. So, Ariman began to hatch a new plot. He took the guise of Asmodeus, a near power just short of being a god, the archdevil, and the lord of evil. But he is more than that, more potent than even the gods, and not dependent on the adoration of mortals. He is trying to get into power by ways of three plans, the blood war, the politics of nobility, and Armageddon. Asmodeus fakes that the blood war is of great importance to him, he sees it as little more than a series of skirmishes that turned into a full-blown war. But by staying at war with the Teneri he makes the upper powers think that, if one of them were to win, they would flood out to the rest of the plains and create a massive war that would end all life. Thus, they continue to let the fiends fight amongst themselves. The second plan, the politics of nobility is more or less the same thing but internal. By keeping the devils occupied with struggling with one another they won't have the resources to fight Asmodeus and his plots. The third one is a far more sinister plot, those who die without believing in anything. Since only the believers can go to an afterlife, those who do not believe are instead sent elsewhere, namely Nessus. But instead of becoming petitioners here and starting out as lemurs, they become chow for Asmodeus. The process of being eaten by a primordial serpent takes centuries, during which the petitioners remain fully aware as they are devoured, feeling nothing but excruciating pain for centuries. Being destroyed in such a way completely undoes the soul in question, so it cannot be brought back in any way. Every soul devoured this way heals Ahriman's wounds a bit more, and when he has fully healed Ahriman will break free of his prison and cast the multiverse back into the primordial chaos it came from. 
nobody, not even Jazirian would be able to stop him, and he would remake the universe to his liking. And this is a bad thing. The lore of Asmodeus eating the souls of atheists has not really been continued out of this book as atheists currently just go to the afterlife that matches their alignment or the wall of the faithless in the Forgotten Realms. 3.5 edition and 3.5 Asmodeus got a new backstory and became a magnificent bastard of massive proportions. In the beginning there were only the Abraths and their spawn the Teneri, but the newborn universe didn't like this and so spat out good aligned beings of order to fight them. Asmodeus was one of these and decided that to truly defeat the demons, they would have to know them and that in order to do that, they would have to become like them. Thus he became the first lawful evil being, don't ask us how chaotic good came to be. In the ancient days the gods were troubled by mortals, because they would do bad things over and over again. Asmodeus, one of the smartest people ever, pointed out it was because there were no repercussions for doing so, and so invented punishment which took the form of a rod with which to strike the guilty. The gods liked the idea, and so Asmodeus and his followers went about punishing mortals that did wrong all over the heavenly realms. Well the gods of good, that they served, got disturbed by this. Sure there were results and mortals were being less of a collection of dicks because of it, but they didn't like evil souls being tortured in their herb gardens. Asmodeus had a solution. He wrote up a giant contract that would make him, and his followers separate from the gods, give him his own realm, a little one layer called Bader, and he and his followers would get energy from those they punish, leaving the gods free from having to manage the thing. It was such a good idea, that all the gods signed it. When Asmodeus and his followers arrived at the dirt hovel plane, after imprisoning its former ruler Zargon, they thought he had gone mad. Then he explained the rest of his plan. A few millennia later, the gods started to notice something was up with the number of souls they were getting. Investigating, they found that Asmodeus had been a productive bastard. Nine layers of hellscape, legions of devils, and innumerable tortured evil souls. Except some of those souls had been bought or corrupted by Asmodeus and his followers. Saint Cuthbert the god of retribution drew forth his mace and shouted you fiend. You are only supposed to punish the wicked, not tempt them into acts of evil. Asmodeus smiled, held out the contract alongside a novelty oversized magnifying glass and said, verbatim, read the fine print. In this edition we see why Asmodeus reinstalled Levistus to his former position as leader of the fifth layer of hell without freeing him from his iceberg prison and more importantly, not providing the traditional promotion makeover. That being everyone would scratch their heads about Levistus, having a high-ranking job, you know, with the whole killing the leader's true waifu thing, instead of scratching their heads about a hag, and not a devil, being the ruler of Melbulge. Since Levistus having the gig of leader of fifth layer was just a distraction, he wasn't granted the promotion upgrade. The nine hells have better use for divine energy than that. Also why let a treacherous bastard out of the ice? And of course maintaining the punishments would attract attention to the strange situation that Levistus was in. Why was the ruler of Malbulge a hag? To have a disposable region keeping a seat warm for ruling a layer of hell until he thought his daughter would handle the job right. 4th edition. Talking about Asmodeus in 4e gets complicated, for a very simple reason, there are two of him in that edition. One is native to the Nenter Vale setting, the core of 4e, who is functionally a brand new individual in terms of lore, and the other is native to the Forgotten Realms, and is supposed to be the same one who's been plaguing the realms from the very beginning of D&D, resulting in the need to build on from his lore from at least 3rd edition. The Asmodeus of the Nenter Vale was once the most powerful archangel of a goodly god, but during the Dawn War, he became convinced that his master was holding back the forces of the gods with his virtuousness and that harsher, more ruthless behavior was required to win. This may have something to do with his claiming a shard of the seed of evil from the abyss, something that also sparked the blood war of the world axis. He spread his beliefs amongst his fellow angels like a poison, swaying them until they were able to rise up en masse and murder their former master. So thoroughly did Asmodeus obliterate even the memory of his former master that only the fact of his prior existence remains in the world today, resulting in this god being called only he who was. Filled with paranoia, that if his old master's name is ever rediscovered, the god could be brought back, Asmodeus stops at nothing to scour for any clues he might have missed. Did this Asmodeus get what he wanted? Well, yes, and no. It is hinted as taking charge of his old master's troops actually did help boost the gods in their war effort, and he was accepted amongst the gods, right up until they realized his treacherous rat bastardry and ambition wasn't sated yet, at which point they backed off. Plus, he who was cursed Asmodeus and all his followers as he died, transforming Bader into the current hellhole that it is, warping them into their present devilish forms, and forcibly binding them in Bader as an inescapable prison until Asmodeus figured out a loophole or two. Incidentally, this is what defines the devils of the Nenter Vale setting, whilst any angel can serve an evil god and still be considered an angel, devils are fallen angels, marked by a divine curse for their treachery and deicide. 
As a god, Nentor Valus Matius has the portfolio of power, domination, and tyranny, and his associated cleric domains in divine power are civilization and tyranny. His three commandments are seek power over others. Repay evil with evil, and exploit the kindness of others. Show neither pity nor compassion for those caught underfoot on your rise to power, the weak do not deserve compassion. Aside from killing he who was, and creating the devils, and possibly orphaning humanity, some believe he who was used to be humanity's patron god, but then again, others claim that humanity's patron was a different god who was murdered by Zeher, the most notable influence that Asmodeus has in the Nentor Vale is being the creator of the tieflings. Long story short, the nobles of the waning human empire of Bale Turath made diabolic pacts with Asmodeus for the survival of their empire, transforming them all irrevocably into the first tieflings. Even though Bale Turath fell in a mutual kill with the empire of Arkosia, scattering tieflings and dragonborn alike across the world, and breeding a strong distaste for their former master in many tieflings, the heirs to Bale Turath are still stereotyped as Asmodians by default in the present. As for the Asmodeus of the Forgotten Realms, basically, this version profited hugely from the spell plague, seizing advantage of the death of Mistra to murder and consume one of her divine underlings, Azuth. This not only propelled him to godhood, but allowed him to tap into the spell plague just long enough to reshape the very structure of the planes themselves, forcing the world tree into the world axis and decisively ending the distraction of the blood war. At least, he claims reshaping the multiverse was his doing. He may just be lying. The Lord of All Devils does that, you know. Also, he supposedly used his new power to claim all of the tieflings in the realms, mutating them into their 4E canon forms as a side effect of marking them. Pathfinder. Like in 4E, Asmodeus is a god, though rather than a devil who worked his way up, he was either a god from the start or one of the oldest ascended outsiders and is one of the biggest players among the gods. The Book of the Dam claims him to be one of a pair of primordial first gods with his brother Ihes, until the two had a falling out on the matter of law versus chaos, gathered allies among younger beings, and in the first act of defect treachery, Ihes was slain by Asmodeus. He then gathered his celestial followers and marched them to hell, a far more empty place back then, and took it over, sculpting one of his archdevils, Mephistopheles, out of the plane itself in his image. The primordial first god story could be BS, other accounts paint him as an ascended celestial, but he's old enough regardless that only the later conflict and hell parts can be confirmed by the other gods. As the god of tyranny, hierarchy, and order, he places law as paramount and is surprisingly easy to deal with for an evil, at least if you yourself are a god. Even the younger and more hothead good gods have consulted him on occasion. Most famously, when Ravagig the Rough Beast went to war with all the other gods, the Emperor Lord Serenry forced it into a prison in the center of Galarian and Asmodeus provided the key, locking it away hopefully forever, but making his position to the gods indispensable. Aside from typical evil nuts, his worshippers include lawyers and other legal professionals. Asmodeus believes the entire multiverse will move past this whole free will thing and fall under his tyranny eventually, but as such an ancient being he is willing to be supremely patient about it, make deals with everyone, and wait for the inevitable. He's sexist, but primarily regarding outsiders as what a damned mortal soul look like in life, has no effect on what devil it can become. Unlike outsiders such as angels, who have male and female individuals of the same type, male and female devils are effectively separate species, or at least life phases. Arides, the most common female devil, are factually one of the weaker types of devils. 5th edition. In 5th edition, things are hazy. The forced reorganization of the planes back into the old Great Wheel means that the blood war restarted without Asmodeus wanting it to, but he's technically still a true god. Azuth, the god he ate, is now back as well, and Ozzy is now weaker for it. In addition, he has now been noted to have in fact been controlling the cults of several other archdevils all along, including his lesser rival and fallen angel, Mephistopheles. His raw power has diminished, but he has a new plot, one which is actually working. He has started to open ledger churches in Toril, and possibly other worlds. By explaining in clear detail to sinners that they will be tortured for all eternity if they're captured by any form of fiend, including Mesilus or worse, Teneri, or if they go to the hells without some form of leg up, they just tell the sinners outright that worshipping Asmodeus will let them start partway up the fiendish hierarchy in petitioner form, which is absolutely true. That annoys the good churches to no end because it's enough to get some desperate old sinners to throw their lot in with Asmodeus right away. To others who aren't ready to sell themselves to him, the churches instead offer services to people who want to conceal things, apologize for their lesser crimes, but can't do it elsewhere, or otherwise cover up sins, which may actually absolve those sinners under some circumstances, or just give them a sense that they can escape all their problems through prayer, and thus encourage them to misbehave more. 
Asmodeus has actually been able to get several Wadadavian nobles to buy his holy symbols and wear them around, which even fiends which became gods, before he did like Orcus never managed. That said, he's still nowhere near as strong as he was when Mr. was dead and Azuth was in his belly, and the fact that he now has to defend against attacks from every direction thanks to the planar shifts, from Carceri not so much, but from the Abyss, you bet, means he's far less free to act covertly, even if his open worship is drawing in souls at a shocking rate. For now, he's collecting cards to his hand, and only time or a new edition will tell what he does next. In the trial of Asmodeus, a bit of Paradise Lost Esk fluff, Angels put out a warrant for Ozzy's arrest and he's offended. So, he writes up a contract that says you're lawful good, I'm lawful evil, let's take it up with a being of pure law, Primus, leader of the moderns, and the Angels, after reading the fine print, signed the contract. When they went before Primus, Asmodeus defended himself with four points, one. He and his devils, and swayed mortals towards evil, yes, but they never violated a contract, and it was always a clear deal. No fine print here. 2. The souls collected go on to serve to beat back the demonic legions of the abyss in the blood war. 3. Asmodeus was following the laws of the nine hells and collecting souls. 4. Mortals who refused a devil's offer were left alone. Primus then heard the angel's testimony. Weeks went by and Primus's patience wore thin, yes, the incarnation of lawful stupid's patience wore thin, and he said only a few more angels would be allowed to speak. The angels fought over who would be allowed to speak. Asmodeus smiled. Primus failed to deliver a definitive verdict, but he did give Asmodeus the ruby rod. The ruby rod guarantees Ozzy's adherence to the law, grants his devils the ability to make deals for souls, and punishes any devil who breaks a deal. Followers. Yeah, anyone lawful evil basically. There are a few who worship other beings, but most of them go to this guy. He's very convincing. They're all gonna go to hell. And while he might promise you something nice once you get there, read the fine print. It ain't worth it. Bane? Not to be confused with a Batman villain, which would be admirable, but mistaken although both are big guys, for you, is the evil D and D deity of conquest and war. Always the most interesting of Pharaoh's evil gods, he was reworked as a core god in 4th edition's default pantheon for the Nenter Vale setting, given a very different backstory and nature. Forgotten Realms. Bane is one of a band of three evil deities collectively nicknamed the Dead Three, alongside his buddies Baal and Merkel. They were originally epic-level evil adventurers who set out to claim the godhood of Jurgil, Faron's original god of strife, death and the dead. They expected a conflict of epic proportions. Instead, the world-weary and jaded deity willingly abdicated, after a game of knucklebones, each took one-third of Jurgil's portfolio. Bane took strife and turned it into the portfolio of war, tyranny, and conquest. He brought his friend Merkel to help steal the Tablets of Fate from Ao because they thought it'd make them omnipotent. This attempt to grab his prize failed, and while they didn't get caught their master plan didn't account for Ao starting the time of troubles to force all the gods to learn some humanity. During this time Bane was forced to walk the prime material as his avatar, which was only big in comparison to humans. During this time he and his butt buddies were killed, leading to them being nicknamed the Dead Three for Vermor. Luckily for him, and showing he isn't completely stupid, he had a contingency in place in case it didn't work out, namely his son Yachtu's vim through which he reincarnated himself and wrestled his portfolio and powers back. Basically a more successful version of his old buddy Baal and his plan for his kids. In 5th edition, he's locked in a cold war with Asmodeus, who doesn't really pay him much attention because he has bigger problems, like dealing with his treacherous archdevil underlings and the blood war. Despite being rightly named the Tyrant God, he has a black monastery in Elchiral, the city of Paladins, which is hilarious. He doesn't act up as much as he used to for story reasons, but TG doesn't let that slow them down, no sir. Not at all. However, the book Descent into Avernus gives him a new status quo, that of a quasi-divine entity. He is explicitly not a true god anymore, although he can still grant spells and even has a physical body somewhere. Larian has confirmed him, and the other dead three are behind part of the plot of Baldur's Gate 3. If this is plans coming to fruition after his death or something by the all now revived trio remains to be seen. Fourth edition. The god who would one day become the Iron General was once one of three brothers. Kord, Tuor and Akra, his original name. Three deities who reveled in combat, but for different reasons. Kord loved competition and proving himself, Tuor loved the pain he caused in his enemies, and Akra loved the domination victory gave him. Initially, the Dawn War went bad for the gods. Each would assemble his or her own armies and go to war with amassed primordials. Initially Tuorn and Akra fought together, but Akra believed that if they were to be victorious, all gods should work together. Rallying the few deities who wanted to fight at his side, he led an army of united gods, angels and mortals, against the forces of the Queen of Bronze, Taverch T. 
after a terrible fight, a cross stood victorious over the queen's body, the first primordial to fall. This had two effects. Firstly, all of the gods now agreed that they needed to work on a united front if they wanted to prove victorious. Secondly, the forces of the primordials gave a new name to the leader of their enemies, the moniker by which he came to be known even amongst mortals. Bane. During his stint as the general of the forces of the gods, Bane befriended Asmodeus, in whom he saw a kindred spirit. Tuorn, on the other hand, got jealous of his brother's position. Things went bad for the Iron General once the war was over, he'd expected to be named King of the Gods, and instead everyone just wanted to get on with their own things. The hope of an ordered and structured world that he would lead was dashed, leaving Bane to plot for the day he would make the world like this. His first step was to both conquer a mighty fortress to use as his own, and to overthrow his rival and brother, Tuorn. In a violent siege Bane killed his brother and took control of the fortress of Tuorn Churn. Now, the other gods were not amused and amassed a massive army led by Moradin and Erethus to stop the Iron General. When suddenly, Groomsh came out of nowhere and bound his own realm of Nishrek to Bane's Shurnagar, putting Turin Churn under constant threat of the One-Eyed God. In the modern day of the default setting, Bane is the evil god of domination, conquest and war. He is unusual in the way that he is not only prayed to by evil people. Even those fighting for good sometimes invoke the Iron General's name at the beginning of battle. Those who conquer in his name might not be so out of greed or glory, but to defend their people. Also, doing what needs to be done for the greater good falls under Bane's mantle, which is fitting, as he is the only evil god who does what he does, because he thinks the world would be better for it. And the scariest part is. He may be right. Realm. Bane's domain is Yurnagar, a 300-mile plateau of Ashen wastes adrift in the Astral Sea. He rules from the fortress city of Tuor Churn, a city constantly busy with the creation of the tools of war and the training of soldiers, Bane's throne room is a truly massive chamber, housing the Iron General's throne, a sight that drives lesser men mad with terror. Servants. Few worship Bane as the only true god. He is often worshipped alongside other deities, and the faithful see him as a figure of protection, albeit a harsh one. Goblinoids, however, worship Bane as their true god, because he managed to best Magluviad, the previous god of all of goblin kind, and took him on as his exarch. He has a fiefdom in Chernagar, a goblin fortress city called Klanger. Hobgoblins are the most devout of Bane's worshippers amongst the goblinoids. Bane also was once served by the bladlings, and a minority of them still remain loyal to their old creator master. Most of them, however, spat on his boots and hightailed it into the astral sea and sigil, due to feeling insulted and betrayed, when he basically dumped them in favor of the goblinoids. Gargoth. Worshipped by some in Faron as a demigod of corruption and betrayal, Gargoth is an archdevil who was apparently exiled from Badr, because he was too much of a handful for the other archdukes of Hell, though much of what happened is never actually revealed. He was probably just a casualty of the politics of Hell, but rather than being cast down or destroyed, he managed to get out. Afterwards he traveled the plains, returning to Toral time and time again. He spreads his cults and corruption around, with the aim of ensnaring the planet, and dragging it back to the Nine Hells, where he can rule it as a tenth layer, because it worked so well for Mephistopheles when he tried it. Though he is also opposed to other evil deities like Shar and Sirik. The fact that Gargoth holds some actual divine status shows that he could have been a serious power player in the politics of Hell, since it took Asmadia so long to attain similar status for himself. Although that also illustrates the point that personal power alone can mean very little on the plains, when the Archdukes of the Nine had much more widespread influence and control. In prior editions he had a magic item, the Shield of the Hidden Lord, which he could speak through. In 5e the shield is no longer an evil artifact created by Gargoth, but instead a celestial artifact in which he has been imprisoned. PCs can possibly find the shield in Descent into Avernus, where Gargoth will try to manipulate them into freeing him. Ilgium. Gilgium is a divinely ascended Gilgamesh, and as such followed the rest of the Untheric pantheon to the Forgotten Realms, when the Proto-Untherites were forcibly splintered from ancient Mesopotamia by the Emiskari. Son of Enlil and brother of Enki, when his father retired from the position of actively ruling over the Untheric pantheon, Gilgium took his place. For centuries, Gilgium was actually a pretty decent leader, and his skills in war were handy when ancient Unther was plunged into the Orkgate Wars. Then came the Battle of the Gods, one of the most bitter battles, when avatars of the Untheric and Mulharandi gods collectively entered the Prime Material Plane to battle the avatars of Gruumsh and the other Orc gods. This battle didn't exactly go the way of the humans, and Tiamat tried to take advantage of the situation to assassinate Gilgium, only to be intercepted by Marduk, resulting in the bitter rivals fighting to a mutual kill. Somehow, this led Gilgium to become a brutal and domineering tyrant as in, he got so bad that the Untherites wanted Tiamat back. And they got their wish, nearly 1300 years later, Tiamat returned to Unther, and during the time of troubles, she immediately went after Gilgium again. 
Whilst Gilgian killed her in their first match, Tiamat had taken steps to avoid death. Once reborn, she attacked again, and this time she killed Gilgian, causing the dissolution of the entire Untheric pantheon. For centuries, Gilgian was forgotten until the Spellplague saw most of Unther sent to Abair. Somehow, their new position as slaves to the Genasi of Shur caused a reincarnation of Gilgian, who led an uprising, largely by forcing a pact with Grast and turning the Untherites into demon binders. When the Sundering returned the Untherites to Toril, he immediately launched the first of a series of war against the dragonborn nation of Tymanther, hoping to recapture the territories that had once belonged to Unther in generations past. Enlil has suggested that this reincarnated Gilgian may be either a brand new deity or a flat out imposter. Shifts in power. Originally, Gilgian was an intermediate deity, but his dwindling in popularity after his descent into tyranny following the Orkgate Wars saw him reduced to the status of demigod, and then Tiamat killed him, and so he became a dead god. Duh. The current Gilgian running around in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is a demigod once more. The many names of Gilgian. Given that he is part of the Untheric pantheon, Gilgian has naturally picked up a wide variety of aliases, not all of them so flattering. The Great. Father of Victory. Master of Wars. God of the Sky and the Cities. Supreme Ruler of Unther, Jacenta, Threskel, Chondath, Termish, the Shar, and Yerwood. The Tyrant. Son of Victory, as his second incarnation. The God who walks the plain, as his second incarnation. Lord of all Unther reborn, as his second incarnation. Yachtu's Vim. Yachtu's Vim, pronounced Yachtu Zvihm, was the half fiend son of Bane, God of Fear, Hatred, and Tyranny in the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. When his father fell as part of the Time of Troubles, Zvim temporarily rose to assume his position. After barely over a decade, he was consumed by his father's spirit, who used the annihilation of his son's essence to propel himself back from the grave and into his full godhood again. Basically, he was 2ES replacement for Bane and was regarded so poorly that they bumped him off in the switchover to Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. Manifestations. As a god that barely deserves the title, Zvim has no appearances beyond that of his mortal incarnation. A skeletal thin cambion, usually running around naked and waving a scimitar. History. In 710 BR, the Yachtus then emerged from a portal above the city of Westgate, and backed by a large army of tiefling warriors and demons, seized the Westgate throne. Zvim's tyrannical rule was ended in 734 BR, when he was driven out by Farnath Ilystar, the rightful heir to the throne. During the time of troubles, the then demigod Zvim was imprisoned within the depths of Gentle Keep. Shortly after his father's demise and the end of the Time of Troubles, Yachtu Zvim was able to make contact with several former Bandite priests who had fled underground following the events of the Bandit of 1361 DR. After a few years of deliberation, the Bandites decide to recognize Zvim as the rightful heir to Bane and tapping into their faith, he began working to free himself from his prison. In Chess 1369 DR, with the aid of his new acolytes, Zvim broke free of his prison beneath the ruins of Gentle Keep and was granted his father's portfolios of hatred, strife, and tyranny, elevating him to the status of a lesser deity. For little over a decade, Zvim reigned as a minor god, a feeble successor to his fearsome sire. During his existence, Zvim was petty, power-hungry, and ruthless, in some ways like his father. However, he was not nearly as strong, especially in comparison with the other new deity in the Ferenian pantheon, Sirk. On midwinter night of 1372 DR, the young god was consumed by a blazing green fire, from which emerged a resurrected bane. Nearly all former clerics of Zvim, who in turn shifted to his allegiance after the death of his father, re-pledged themselves to the Church of Bane. Zvim is now considered a dead god, and for as long as his father holds on to divinity, he will probably remain as such. Dogma. Obey or die in pain and utter destruction. Enslave or slay the weak, and be sure that they know their suffering is in Zvim's name and by his will. Cause pain and fearful obedience in others whenever prudent. Be a cruel, heartless tyrant, and Zvim shall be pleased. Slay the priests of other gods whenever you can do so without being identified by others. Capture tyrants and take them to senior clergy members to be delivered unto Zvim. Capture all wizards and bring their magic to the church or bring them to Zvim's most senior servants so that they can be transformed into creatures who will do service to Zvim as guardians. Spread fear of Zvim over all the lands. Destroy whatever and whoever bars his will and see that word of his power spreads, but that no one survives to describe your deeds in detail except mortals who worship him. Destroy all witnesses to secret acts, but leave alive survivors to tell of Zvim's power when spreading casual destruction. There is a delight in destruction feel it and indulge in it. Leviator. Leviator, Akka the Maiden of Pain, not to be confused with the Lady of Pain, the Willing Whip and the Scourge Mistress, is the malevolent goddess of agony in the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. 
Having been around since the days of advanced Dungeons and Dragons, she is based on the Finnish goddess Leviator, the blind goddess of disease, and daughter of the god of death. In fact, old school lore actually describes her as being the Finnish goddess, who broke away from her apathetic pantheon and sought vitality by finding new worshippers, succeeding by breaking into the crystal sphere of Toril. Publication History Ed Greenwood created Leviator in his home games of Dungeons and Dragons, confessing that she was inspired by the Finnish goddess of the same name, who was depicted in the original Deities and Demigod Cyclopedia. He even went so far as to make her explicitly the Finnish Leviator, seeking a renewed worshipper base elsewhere, although this aspect of her lore dropped off around the time of 3rd edition. She first made her debut in the days of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 1st edition, as one of the deities featured in Ed Greenwood's article Down to Earth Divinity, in Dragon No. 54, October 1981. Leviator is introduced as the Maiden of Pain and Torture, Goddess of Pain, Hurt, and Patron of Torturers, a lawful evil demigoddess from the Plain of Gehenna. Leviator is described as one of the dark gods of evil alignment. Leviator, Talona, and Mailer serve Bane through Baal, although Leviator and Talona are rivals. Leviator is commonly worshipped by lawful evil magic users, assassins, monks, and clerics, and characters employed as torturers. Leviator later officially appeared as one of the major deities for the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, in the Forgotten Realms campaign set Cyclopedia of the Realms booklet, 1987, where she is described as a pale maiden in white armor who wields a wand-shaped dagger of ice, and is stated to be the same Leviator as the one in Finnish legend. When second edition rolled along, Leviator was fully cemented into place, she was there from the original hardback Forgotten Realms Adventures, 1990, followed by the revised Forgotten Realms campaign setting, 1993, where she appeared in the Running the Realms booklet, and in 1996's Faiths and Avatars. The 1996 and 1997 Faron cleric-centered Splatbooks warriors and priests of the realms and prayers from the faithful further established her cult, whilst her interactions with the non-human deities of Faron was covered in 1998's Demihuman Deities. 1996 was such a good year for her that she even made it into Planescape, thanks to the Splatbook on Hallowed Ground, when Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition rolled on, Leviator remained solidly in place, debuting in the 3EFR campaign setting, 2001, and receiving an expansion in Faiths and Pantheons the next year. In Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition, like most of the more generic deities, Leviator slipped in prestige. She wasn't demoted to Exarch status, instead being named a god-level entity, but her only mentions are in the big table of Toril's deities in the 4EFR campaign setting, and the fact she got her associated cleric domains, mentioned in the Dragon Magazine article, applying that mechanic from divine power to the gods of the Forgotten Realms and the Baron. In Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, she made her initial debut as part of a table of deities in the back of the player's handbook, and received a basic ritup in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Worshippers? Bringing pain and suffering was the aim of all of Iotans, either through physical torture or sometimes more subtly and psychologically. Beauty, intelligence and acting were useful attributes of a Leviathan, but the ability to fully understand someone was the best skill a Leviathan could acquire, as knowing someone fully could help a Leviathan inflict maximum pain, one way or another. Leviathan's followers were encouraged to wipe Ilmater's followers from the face of the realms. Leviathans often engaged in self-flagellation, often in the morning when praying for spells. They celebrated each season with a rite of pain and purity, a ritual that involved followers dancing on glass, horns or barbed wire, while being whipped by higher level leviathans. A smaller ritual occurring every 12 days involved followers passing their bodies through the flames of candles. During warfare, priestesses of Leviator scored their naked shoulders or tore their cheeks with their nails to evoke magic. Priests of Leviator are called, simply, pains. Loviations are known to run BDSM clubs in order to try and gain greater funding and inroads amongst the ranks of the sexually perverse. Leviator's worship is the state religion of Dambrath. Relationships. Once a follower of Baal, Leviator was affiliated with Mailer and Talona, and had fallen under the sway of Shar, though the return of Bane changed this, as she once again served as his consort. Leviator's portfolio conflicted most with that of Ilmater, because Leviator despised those who helped others. She also hated Eldath and Lyra for offering rewards without any suffering to achieve them. Dogma. The world is filled with pain and torment, and the best that one can do is to suffer those blows that cannot be avoided, and deal as much pain back to those who offend. Kindnesses are the best companions to hurts, and increase the intensity of suffering. Let mercy of sudden abstinence from causing pain and of providing unlooked for healing, come over you seldom, but at whim, so as to make folk hope and increase the mystery of Leviator's mercy. Unswerving cruelty will turn all folk against you. Act alluring, and give pain and torment to those who enjoy it, as well as to those who deserve it most, or would be most hurt by it. The lash, fire, and cold are the three pains that never fail the devout. Spread Leviator's teachings whenever punishment is meted out. 
pain tests all, but gives strength of spirit and true pleasure to the hardy and the true. There is no true punishment if the punisher knows no discipline. Wherever whip is, there is Leviator. Fear her and yet long for her. Reroll is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out, and if you decide to buy the app use promo code McBeardia for 10% off, and it also lets them know we sent you, it's a great sponsor and a great app, and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Oral. Oral is the Forgotten Realms goddess of cold and winter. She is the boss of the 5th edition adventure Icewind Dale. Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Lore. Oral was believed to have been once one of the Archfey, specifically, the Queen of Air and Darkness, who gained her divinity by absorbing power from the slumbering Eulidu, one day, hoping to completely absorb the gods' portfolios and gain control over all things related to cold. Though not written down, the developers have not flat out confirmed or denied this implied theory, and even put forth a counter theory that the Queen of Air and Darkness and Oral have on occasion been gaining additional influence by impersonating each other. Dogma cover all the lands with ice. Quench fire wherever it is found. Let in the winds and the cold, cut down windbreaks and chop holes in walls and roofs that my breath may come in. Work darkness to hide the cursed sun, so that the chill that Oral brings may slay. Take the life of an arctic creature only in great need, but all others at will. Make all fair and fear the frost maiden. Revere the cold goddess and sing her praises into any chill breeze or winter wind. Do not raise your hand against any other cleric of Oral. Baal. Baal is the god of murder from the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. Patron god of assassins, his holy symbol is a skull or skull-like desiccated face, surrounded by nine blood droplets, forming a counterclockwise circle around it. Baal was once a mortal, a brutal assassin who, alongside Bane and Merkel, was part of the Dead Three, epic-level evil adventurers who sought to slay Jurgil, Faron's original god of strife, death and the dead. Instead, the world-weary and jaded deity willingly abdicated, after a game of knucklebones, each took one-third of Jurgil's portfolio. Baal took the portfolio of death, becoming the lord of all murderers and assassins. Officially, Baal got killed off at the end of 1E, as part of the Avatar trilogy tie-in novels event. This was used to explain why the assassin class got removed in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2E, when Baal died, all of Faron's assassins were obliterated as part of the backlash. Baal is the keystone of the excellent AD&D video games known as the Baldur's Gate trilogy, in which you play one of the mortal heirs Baal created to ultimately resurrect himself with, a trick that Bane also succeeded pulling off. In fairness, it ultimately did work for Baal it just took some time. Larian has confirmed him and the other dead three are behind part of the plot of Baldur's Gate 3. If this is plans coming to fruition after his death or something by the, all now revived, trio remains to be seen. Baalists believe that every murder committed strengthened holy Baal, as a result, they viewed murder as both a pastime and a duty. Ballists were required to deal death once in every ten day during the darkest period at the heart of the night. If imprisonment or other constraining circumstances made this impossible, they had to murder twice for each death missed. In accordance with the Lord of Murder's teachings, Ballists strove to ensure before they died, murder victims knew who was killing them, and that their death was in the name of Ball. Novices of Ball were charged as follows. Make all folk fear Ball. Let your killings be especially elegant, or grisly, or seem easy, so that those observing them are odd or terrified. Tell folk that gold proffered can make the Lord of Murder overlook them for today. Merkel. Merkel is the god of death in the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. Merkel was originally a mortal prince, who became a necromancer and joined a group of epic-level adventurers called the Dead Three, alongside the Tyrant Bane and the Assassin Baal. The Three's goal was to gain godhood by slaying the, the former god of strife, death, and the dead, Jurgil. After reaching him however, he revealed that he had guided them all along to him, having gotten tired of his position. After a game of knucklebones, each took a third of Jurgil's portfolio, with Merkel claiming the portfolio of the dead. Jurgil also became a mentor to Merkel, wanting to instruct and advise him in his new position. Merkel was thought to have died during the time of troubles and been succeeded by Kalember, but had actually been residing in an artifact called the Crown of Horns, corrupting any who found it to worshipping him. He eventually regained his godhood during the Sundering. He was also behind the events of Neverwinter Nights 2. Mask of the Betrayer, where you could also kill him, peacefully by sending his essence on in peace or violently, by absorbing him into your spirit-eating curse. Doing the latter would eventually turn your character into a plain-hopping god-eating abomination. 
Larian has confirmed him and the other dead three are behind part of the plot of Baldur's Gate 3. If this is plans coming to fruition after his death or something by the all now revived trio remains to be seen. Prior to the events of the 5e book Descent into Avernus, he returned as a quasi-divine entity, meaning he actually has a physical body again. However, he explicitly lacks his old divine power. Shar. Shar is the goddess of darkness in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Being the opposite of light, she is invariably an evil deity and one of the major players of the realms. Sure, Bane and Sirik get more screen time and are generally seen to be more diabolical, but Shar is quietly competent and probably succeeds in being the true BBEG of the setting with the subtler, long-term plans. History. Shar was created by Ao at the dawning of the material universe. In the beginning there was only Shar and her sister Selyun, who represented two opposing cosmic forces. However, since not much was going on in the empty universe and, since both were fairly innocent at the time there wasn't much animosity between them. However, Al was a deadbeat dad who never spent any time with his kids, Shar and Selyun decided to entertain themselves by combining their forces to make things and set about crafting everything material. They crafted the earth and called her Chantia then went about filling it with all sorts of forces and creatures which necessitated making more gods for them to play with. Unfortunately this was when disagreements began to start about how the universe should look like, and while gods of goodness and creation came into being as part of their works, gods of tragedy and destruction also found their place in the new world. So, like any god, when they had completed their work they decided to rest and have some bruscus. It was only when Chantia reckoned she was a bit cold that the sisters came into major conflict. Selyun ignited a star and called it Aminator, bringing light and warmth into the universe. Unfortunately Shar was nursing such a terrible hangover from celebrating the universe's ribbon cutting that she couldn't tolerate the light and got into a mighty bad mood and demanded Selyun turn it off. When Selyun responded that one simply doesn't turn Aminator off, Shar got mad and started pulling the blinds over the universe in an attempt to keep the light out. Selyun had had enough of that shit and exclaimed, you don't like the light. Have some of this and proceeded to tear a piece of herself off and throw it at Shar. She's hardcore like that, wounding Shar but leaving Selyun badly diminished, reducing her from greater goddess level down to intermediate. However, the chunks of light that were ripped off commingled with the opposing forces of dark and created something entirely new, Mistral, goddess of magic, who looked down at her broken parent with pity and proceeded whoop the ass of Shar seven ways to Sunday. Shar retreated into the darkness of the night to brood, as is her prerogative, while the other gods got on with the business of running the universe. The Shadow Weave. When faced with this new unexpected force called magic that was utterly under the control of her belligerent daughter Mistral, Shar set about doing her own version that she could control. She succeeded in manufacturing a second magical weave, imaginatively called the Shadow Weave. Shar's new weave allows arcane and divine spellcasting in much the same way as the normal one, but enhances casting enchantment, illusion, and necromancy spells as well as anything with the darkness descriptor, providing plus one to save DCs and caster checks. Unfortunately it is unwieldy for creating matter and energy, so it diminishes evocation and transmutation spells by a whole caster level. It is also utterly useless for casting any spell with a light descriptor. Note, this form of casting has nothing to do with the Shadowcaster class, which is an all-new mechanic, but is probably thematically correct, learning the secrets of the Shadow, Weave drops the wisdom of its user by two points. However this drop can be negated if the user receives an atonement spell from a worshipper of Shar. This way the Goddess of Darkness can keep a tight rein on who uses it, rather than advertising it for everyone. It might seem that there are few benefits from using the Shadow Weave over the normal one and too many penalties. However, the Shadow Weave works reliably pretty much anywhere. There are no wild magic or dead magic zones in the Shadow Weave, where Mistress Weave steadily became worse and worse as additions went by. Shar also isn't dying and being replaced all the damn time either. Shadow Weave magic can also be harder to identify and counter spell, though specific feats are required for that. Also, using the Shadow Weave is a requirement for entering certain prestige classes. Worshippers, Shadow Adepts. While the first unique class associated with Shar technically doesn't have anything to do with her at all, any discussion of her other followers would not be complete without exploring the Shadow Adept. While any normal caster can use the Shadow Weave and leave it there, this class represents someone who makes it their career to explore the mysteries of Shadow Weave magic and get the most out of it. The Shadow Adept is in caster of level 3 arcane or divine spells, who has the Shadow Weave feat, and at least one other metamagic feat. So it's easy to qualify for. 
Straight away this class continues with full spellcasting progression and immediately unlocks all of the basic shadow weave metamagic feats, insidious, pernicious, and tenacious magic, so you don't need to earn them through normal leveling, and makes your magic more difficult to identify and dispel, and easier to overcome weave users' magic with. They also gain another metamagic feat of their own choice midway through the class. Their main draw should be that they also gain up to plus 3 bonuses to their spell DCs, caster level checks, and saves against necromancy, illusion, and enchantment spells, making their casting even better with their primary spell schools. So far we've just been talking about numerical advantages, and no actual unique abilities that provide flavor. Well, you level up you gain low light vision and dark vision, because no class of shadow would be complete without it, and also the shadow walk spell was thrown in there for good measure. They can also create a purple disc of shadow that acts like the shield spell, but also provides a 30% mischance on incoming attacks, and later provides up to spell resistance 22, so low level casters fighting them might as well go home. The ultimate ability of the class is to create a shadow copy of yourself that can act in your stead for a short period of time. It's not quite a full simulacrum or a clone and needs to be mentally controlled, but it has your statistics and can act as the originator for the spells you cast, so you can use it to fool your opponents into believing you are somewhere else. Night Cloaks. Shar's actual unique prestige class is the Night Cloak and is her specialist divine casting class intended for clerics, but you could probably qualify with Druid or Ranger if you really tried, though you'd have a hard time convincing your GM that Shar accepts nature worshippers in her ranks. It's got quite stringent requirements for qualifying to Shadow Weave Magic, Iron Will, Spell Focus, in one of the Shadow Weave schools, and one of the Shadow Weave Metamagic feats. It requires a bunch of skills that aren't typically associated with the Cleric class, such as Hide, Bluff, and Perform, so multiclassing might be an option. It also requires you to be neutral evil, and if you do have Cleric levels you must have access to the Darkness Domain. When you get into the class you continue with a full spellcasting progression, but you don't gain the raw numerical power of the Shadow Adept class listed above, instead you gain more special abilities as you level up, though it's a bit of an unfocused mishmash of combat, stealth and social abilities. At the beginning, the Darkness Domain spells are added to your normal Divine spellcasting list, this can be of benefit if your start out class wasn't Cleric, such as Favored Soul or Archivist. You also gain Dark Vision, of course, but with the ability to see through magical darkness and you cannot ever be magically blinded. you get better with Shar's chosen weapon, the Chakram, so you're pretty much being forced to use it. They automatically get a plus 2 enhancement and the returning quality when wielded by you, and can later be imbued with the unholy quality. Once per 10 day, they can summon a small army of shadow undead creatures. One per level for a number of rounds equal to their level. So maxing at 10 shadows for 10 rounds, these shadows can create more shadows with their drain ability, and any new ones fall under the control of the nightcloak until the duration ends. So at high level you can pretty much lay waste to small sections of battlefields by generating a cascading wave of incorporeal undead. Even against hardass, high level, creature this ability will fuck them up, because although shadows only gave a bab of plus one, they automatically drain d6 points of strength on a touch attack, so armor, shields of natural AC doesn't apply, so being mobbed by 10 at once can seriously cause their strength to diminish fast. They can also mess with minds, gaining the ability to communicate silently with other worshippers of Shar. Later they can modify memories, as per the spell. They add their own intelligence modifier to their saving throws. And in the end they can use Dominate Monster with their voice like some evil being Jesserit Witch. Velsharun. Essentially a poor man's Vecna, Velsharun was a mortal, well, undead, necromancer and former Red Wizard of Fae who was sponsored to Godhood by Talos. It is suspected that Owl allowed the apotheosis due to Kalimber's dislike of the undead, so required a new god to rebalance the pantheon. The god of storms and destruction did not actually desire a servant. Although Velsharun served his patron for two years, it became clear that his patron was fattening him up to be consumed. Velsharun promptly switched allegiances to Azuth, and in so doing earned him the de facto protection of Mister, which managed to keep the wrath of Talos at bay. The demigod Lick uses his masters as a shield to protect him from the fallout of his dickishness and Azuth is generally unhappy with the arrangement, but cannot do anything about it since Velsharun genuinely does fulfill his role as the patron of necromantic magic. However, the god of the undead has secretly made a new pact with Talos to unleash more undead creations upon the world and also has since begun flirting with the dark forces of Shar. None of his plots came to fruition, however, as he was killed during the spell plague. And unlike some other deities, he died a true death. Supposedly his corpse ended up in the hands of the symbol. 
No tabletop RPG table is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimuchi Wizard the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Bella Dafine the succubus that's poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below, but let's get back to the video. Bishaba. Bishaba, the maid of misfortune, is the bad part of Titch that split during the dawn cataclysm history. Bishaba got all of the good looks of Titch, but was rotten right to the core. A genuine man-eater, all men who meet her gaze are completely driven with lust or become instantly devoted to her. Whilst women become manic in her presence. She is given to random capricious behavior and bouts of jealousy. She commands that her priesthood be given equal status to her sister Tamora and is placated more than venerated. She is fully capable of turning up uninvited if she chooses and has been masquerading in the name of Shondical in the region of Anorich for ages. The fear of her manifesting during ceremonies dedicated to other gods is enough to make sure that everyone pays at least some level of lip service to her, whilst her clergy continue to perpetuate the fear of her by spreading random acts of wickedness and cruelty about the realms. Realm. Bishaba's realm, called Blood Tor is a single granite tower located on a hill, though the location of the hill changes between additions. The tower is slick with blood of the misfortunate mortals who died in deadly accidents that were the fault of Bishaba. In 4e she moved her realm to Warrior's Rest to be closer to her lover Tempus, because that was a thing for some reason. In 5e she got Blood Tor back, although now it's a layer of the abyss which she co-rules with Umberly. Sirik. Sirik is the god of lies, strife, murder and bad things from Forgotten Realms. He has a long history of ruining other people's shit, though not always, or even often, to his own benefit. He was mad for a while, because he read his own hypnotizing bible, but that ended a while later, because the follower of Agma that he'd coerced into writing it decided to try again, and cider sources this time, which got 10k upvotes on our quitter bullshit. He's the one that kicked off the spell plague, for example, by murdering the goddess of magic, so a bunch of other deities threw him in a fiendish drunk tank for a thousand years. Sirik is the rare case of an underdog that nobody likes. Coming to power during the time of troubles, he slew a couple of gods by using the portfolio stealing sword god Spain, really mask and avatar form, because he decided he was gonna take the situation as an opportunity to get in those guts. First, he killed Baal, because the plot had set up the dead three as the bad guys, then Lara because he felt like being in charge of lies, then Midnight, who later became Mistra, killed Merkel but Sirik still got the power, because he's a loot stealing fuck like that. When the time of troubles ended, he was pretty chuffed with how things ended up, except for the fact that Kalemver Lionsbane was still alive, an easily fixable situation. So he stabbed a bitch and reclined on the skull throne he'd inherited from Merkel to await dear Kel's soul, which never came. This is where our boy starts to get anxious. You see, having grown up with a stereotypical rogue background, he was always having to watch his back and never get too comfortable. So, in a stroke of brilliance the rivals my dad deciding not to wear a condom, he released an ancient primordial named Kezif, the Chaos Hound, think Fenrir, complete with biting off the tur of the setting's hand, but more has maggots instead of fur. Kezif's shtick is that he hunts and eats the souls of the faithful before they can get to their respective afterlives because he really goes in for the taste. Naturally, one could assume that he would hunt down the wayward Kalember's soul and then bring it back to Sirik with his tail wagging, right? No, because Mask was hiding Kalember's soul within Godspain, because he wanted to use it as leverage to levy Lara's portfolio off of Sirik. Unfortunately, Sirik ended up catching on and snapped the sword over his knee, casting Mask in the role of Batman during this event and declared the jig was up. Luckily, Kalember just popped out and started wrestling with him, which somehow didn't immediately end badly for him. Well I suppose Sirik was a bit distracted with the massive uprising stirred up by Mistra and the City of the Dead over him being such a shoddy ruler, but come on. Garagos. To make any claim that Garagos is a servant of Tempus would be to invite a bitch fit the likes of which you have never seen. Originally thought slain in the early battles over who would become Lord of Battles, Garagos was actually dormant and has only reappeared recently when a demon entered the realms and started using Garagos' name to start an evil cult of war and fury, prompting the real Garagos to manifest and rip at a new one. He represents war in its pure form of rage and violence, though in earlier times he was considered to be more even-tempered, since his return he is said to have lost all sense of mercy. 
it is believed these changes to his mentality forced him to move his divine realm from chaotic limbo to the more dour insane pandemonium, either that or he was secretly in love with someone, it is not mentioned who, although his clergy are forbidden from acting against the Church of Shar, and the move to pandemonium, represented him giving up all hope. Other punters say this is retarded, and that Garagos had just started his decline into pure evil, with his realm moving with him. It is thought, the Tempest keeps him around for some reason, possibly because he didn't want the aspects of Garago's portfolio to merge with his own. Other thinkers believe, the Tempest is allowing him to continue with existence, because he knows, that someone else might challenge him for the position of Lord of Battle such as interloper gods of war from other realms, and her from the Mulharandi pantheon comes to mind. Therefore Tempest may be keeping him around to use a stalking horse to flush out any potential rivals. In any case, Garagos doesn't care what Tempest's intentions are, and seeks to unseat his old enemy himself, though he simply doesn't have the power, or the brains, to do so. Avatars of Garagos appear as multi-armed giants wielding a different weapon in each hand. The number of arms varies, but is never less than five and he can grow new ones at will. Alternate forms include a floating mist of blood, that acts as a poison to anyone other than the faithful of Garagos. For unknown reasons, at certain times of year, when the stars align in a particular way, his avatar and those of Sherus and Jurgil are summoned to God's walk keep in the border kingdoms of the realms as part of the meeting of the three. Lucky adventurers who witness this event gain the power of tree seeing for one day per level, though to actually witness this event you need to be within line of sight to the raging multi-armed avatar of the god of indiscriminate destruction and actually survive the experience. Baylor. Mailer is the dark, malevolent god of predation and slaughter in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons. He is part of the sub-pantheon known as either the gods of fury or the deities of fury, who embody the most brutal and malign aspects of nature. This makes him a peer of Talos, or Alain Umberly. As you can probably guess from that opening spiel, Mailer isn't your typical fluffy bunny nature god. He's all about the idea of nature red in tooth and claw, survival of the fittest, and generally being the apex predator. He kills who he wants, when he wants, and that's usually anybody he sees, whenever he sees him. He is known and dreaded as Kazgrath, a twisted dragon-like creature, in the Munchi Isles, Blue Bear to the Uthgurt Barbarians, Hearn to the Orcs of the High Forest, Render on the Endless Ice and the Great Glacier, and the Stalker in Vilhin Reach. The two sacred ceremonies of Mailer are the High Hunt, where a random humanoid is kidnapped and hunted by crazy Mailer cultists from sundown till sunup, and the Feast of the Stags, where a Malrite priest picks some random unfortunate, and makes sure they get plenty of meat and fur, to keep them alive through the winter. Notable enemies of Mailer include Sylvanus, Chantia and Nibanian. Mailer was first created by Ed Greenwood, mentioned in the Down to Earth Divinity article of Dragon Magazine No. 54, October 1981, page 52. Mounder. Mounder was the god of decay and corruption, in the Forgotten Realms. He was effectively their version of Nurgle, who has went from a full-fledged god to something else now. History. Mounder was one of the gods born from the primordial battle between Selyun and Shar, having been born alongside Jurgil and Garagos. He was also the one responsible for corrupting Titch, having created a rose that slowly turned her twisted, leading to her being cleaved in two, and splitting into Tamora and Bashaba. In 75 DR, Mounder attacked the elven city of Tsornal, corrupting all local life and his followers into monsters. Though elves fought well, the avatar of the god proved too strong to kill, so they opted to seal it within the city, causing the god's influence to plummet for a long time. The elves fought to keep the god's avatar locked and dealt with the remaining followers, until 1357 DR, when a mercenary group was fooled into releasing the avatar. The group did however manage to kill the avatar, and after a long series of events, the god itself was killed in his home plane, and his divinity used by Finder Wyvernspur to ascend to godhood. Then the sundering happened, and a lot of people suddenly woke up as warlocks, having had a dream where they were told to do the will of Mounder, or by consumed by the rot from within. Talona. Talona is the goddess of poison and disease in the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. Ed Greenwood has stated that, like Leviator, Talona was inspired by the Finnish pantheon's presence in the Deities and Demigod Cyclopedia for od and and she was based upon Kiputido, a Finnish goddess of disease. Perhaps an homage of this, old lore for Talona claims that Kiputido was a rival disease goddess that challenged Talona, lost, and was slain by her for the affront. In addition to praying to her to Bethel, one can pray for her to grant protection from her portfolio, with rituals involving three drops of blood or three tears onto the infected object of question. She has few cults or shrines, but some priests or temples might be dedicated to her after surviving from pestilence. Talos. Talos, Akka the Storm Lord, is the god of storms and destruction in the Forgotten Realm setting of Dungeons and Dragons. As you might expect, Talos is not a very nice guy. 
He kind of looks like Adam, taking the form of a broad-shouldered wild-bearded human man with one good eye and one empty eye socket filled with whirling stars, which he covers with a dark eye patch. He wears half-plate armor over black leather armor and black leather gloves in case you needed more proof that he's a bad guy. Talos' dogma is self-serving, demanding utter obedience from his priests and instructing them to spread destruction where they may. He is known as Bailrose to the Kalashites and Kaza to the Bedin in the desert areas, he takes on the avatar of a dusky-skinned turban jinni, rising from amidst a sandstorm. Followers of Talos are known as Talassans. Cult. The Church of Talos is small by the standards of a greater deity and almost universally despised due to the asshole nature of God and followers both still, the fanatical fervor of his worshippers helps make up for their limited numbers. The cult's major sources of income are raiding or extorting sailors and farmers, using threats of destructive storms and other natural disasters, such as wildfires, earthquakes and whirlpools, to force them to pay tribute in order to buy off Talos' wrath. This worship of fear also gives Talo some of his power, as it makes up for the relative scarcity of people who actually want to worship him. Still, despite this, Talos ever wishes to expand his influence, and his clerics are charged with spreading his worship, which they commit to with the same fanatical fervor they do everything else, seeking to convert through fear or the enticement of raw power. Talos inspires worship in those who fear the destructive power of nature. His followers are aligned chaotic evil, chaotic neutral, or neutral evil. Worshippers include barbarians, fighters, druids, and half-orcs. They believe in grabbing what they can when they can, for Talos may take their lives at any time. They believe in fearlessly embracing natural disaster, in doing so they demonstrate the power of Talos, who protects them from harm. They preach that only worship of Talos can protect against natural disasters, and at Talos' whim, they hurl such disasters at foes. Talasan clerics are wont to pursue wealth, luxury and wantonness. Many indulge in acts of random or spiteful violence, pillage and banditry. Talas and clerics attack in groups to raise settlements that attempt to resist them. Worship of Talos is outlawed in many countries. Most Talas and holy sites are secret because of the church's reputation. Public churches often take the form of castles or fortified strongholds that lie on earthquake fault lines or in the path of storms or lava. Talos ensures they remain unscathed. The clergy has no formal hierarchy, obedience is enforced through might. Clerics of Talos celebrate Talas and festivals with ceremonies that summon lightning and storms. Their most sacred ritual, calling down the thunder, involves the sacrifice of an intelligent being by lightning. The most frequent cleric ritual is the fury, in which the cleric prays, makes berserk attacks to wreak as much destruction as possible in a small amount of time, then prays again. Clerics of Talos are nicknamed Doom Crows because of their formal dress. They wear black robes and cloaks shot through with teardrops and jagged lines of gold and silver. High clergy wear blue-white ceremonial robes streaked with crimson. All clerics wear an eye patch. Talasan clerics generally multi-class to Barbarian, Sorcerer, the Stormlord Prestige class, and Wizard. Formal orders of Talos are, understandably, rare, and shrouded in secrecy. The only two known orders are the Lords of the Tempest, Wizard specializing in exotic combinations of elemental magic, and the Circle of Rust and the Worm, a cabal of crazed sages and mystics of assorted disciplines, both religious and secular, intent on bringing about the end of the world. Talos is reputed to have served as a patron to more than one lick. In the Pantheon, Formed from the first battle between Selyun and Shar, Talos is the leader of the deities of fury, those forgotten realms deities associated with the savage, destructive side of nature. He has a close relationship with Oral, a relationship with Umberly characterized by both flirtation and rivalry, and a grudging alliance with Mailer, who would kill him if he could. Talos elevates mortals to divinity and forces them to deplete themselves in his service. In AD and D lore, he once assumed the alias Malak and attempted to gain dominion over wild magic, but was foiled by Mistra. In 5th edition, this was reckoned, and Malak became a drow god exclusively, with no ties to Talos. As you can probably expect, Talos hates deities that promote building, learning, nature, and the altering of weather. Chief among his enemies are Chantia, Eldath, Ladhander, Mistra, Soon, Denair, Gond, Helm, Ilmater, Myliki, Agma, Shialia, Sylvanus, and Tur. According to Agma, Talos has often suggested the destruction of the moon as a solution to problems presented to the Pantheon in Sinosher. There is a certain resemblance between Talos and Grumsh, and in 4th edition, it was suggested that the two were actually the same deity using different guises to appeal to different races. This idea was dropped in 5th edition. Umberly. Umberly is the Forgotten Realms goddess of the ocean, currents, sea wind, and waves. Unusually for an evil deity, especially a chaotic evil one, Umberly has a shtick beyond death cults and conspiracies to take over the world. As goddess of the ocean, she runs temples in civilized port towns that shake down sailors for offerings in exchange for safe passage. And yes, the Eich Queen is one of her actual titles. 
dogma. The sea is a savage place, and those that travel it had best be willing to pay the price of challenging Umberley's domain. Fair offerings bring fair winds to sea travelers, but those that do not pay their respects will find that the sea is as cold as Umberley's heart. Spread the word of the might of Umberley, and let no service be done in her name without a price. Make folk fear the wind and wave, unless a cleric of Umberley is there to protect them. Slay those who ascribe sea and shore storms to Talos. Well guys hope you enjoyed today's video we are going to assume you have, if you have stayed to the end, consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell, if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties, and our sponsor reroll and make sure to use the promo code at checkout, to let them know we sent you, and until next time.